uh, in today's topic we are going to look into service now basics and administration we'll also have an overview about uh, basics on scripting and then high level portal configurations so first and foremost we need to understand what is service now so on a high level whenever uh, you know you talk about service now it's it's just a java application so when you're working in service now uh, you won't be writing any java code you will be writing javascript these two are way two different concepts java is a little complex javascript is on a lighter note it's a little bit easier and it's that is what the uh, browser and uh, understandable uh, language so uh, we'll dive deep as we go but on a high level uh, it's a java application and as we see here we are having uh, internet and client machines this could be a browser uh, anything else but that is first an application and once uh, an application is you know spun up and running somewhere it needs a place to store that is what we call it as database so the databases are the ones where whatever we configure, write a code, uh, create an incident, uh, create a task, everything gets stored in the database and application nodes are the one where the Java application runs. So it's again a browser understandable one. So anytime I open the service no application from the client machine via the internet, it connects through a load balancer again. Service now as a customer or let's say as an end user, millions of users can use at a single time, right? So let's say at this point in time, uh, there are a thousand customers who are logging into the instance, trying to crea uh, create some ticket or create some request. During those time, it should balance the load and then efficiently manage it. So that's why from the client machine over the internet, we have load balancers. There are application nodes and then databases available. At the end, there are read replicas. So this is a concept where in case of large customers uh, it will try to replicate and keep the data as and when it's ready and there is always two nodes available primary and secondary in case if something goes wrong let's say a natural calamity or in most cases if there is uh, an application node going down due to performance issues and all those the secondary can be spun up in a fraction of seconds that is the beauty of service now and that's why the Service now uptime, if we look at the data, uh, the production is almost 99.9 percentage. .9 it's always up for any of the production customers. So as and when the primary goes down, uh, there will be a P0 or P1 ticket raised and in the back end, the service now experts will flip it to secondary. Again, these knowledge, uh, it's just an high level overview about what is service now. Again, it's just a Java application which runs completely on application nodes sitting somewhere in the cloud. And again, cloud is nothing but a server located elsewhere. And then the application always stores all the information back in the database. And the database is always replicated and primary secondary is always available. So that being said, let's quickly jump into the instance. So you can procure an instance by navigating into developer.servicenode.com. Once you go, you'll find an option to uh, you know sign up and then procure an instance. So the latest version right now here is Utah, uh, but anywhere between Utah, Tokyo, anything should be sufficient to uh, play around whatever we are doing. Currently, my instance is in Tokyo. How can I verify that? You know, there is a statistics page available for us, which we can uh, navigate through. After procuring, this is how the instance may look like. Once you log in, uh, you'll have all these uh, user interface shown up to you. And this is where we start navigating into the systems. So anything we type, anything we uh, you know make or changes, let's say if I go ahead and click this, it's actually JavaScript that is uh, happening in the backend. It understands the system and the application converts whatever uh, that I request into a database query. It queries a database and gives back all the information to uh, the browser. So this is where the filter navigator is. Uh, everything and anything inside service now will be available for us via the filter navigator. 
So for example, if I say I want to look into the incidents created today or all the open incidents, I can just search here in the filter navigator. It will show all the application menus and modules. So the top one that we see under arrow, this is what we call application menu. Anything under this is what we call it as a module. So when I click on this, platform understands that I'm requesting some data about all the open incidents. So it converts this request that I made from the browser. And this conversion is where the Java application is coming into picture. It processes all those and then sends this information into a database understandable language. That is nothing but a database query. Where is the database? The database will give us all the information in tables and columns format. And that format is again processed by the Java application, which is nothing but service now, the platform itself. It will process that and it will give back those information to the browser window. And once the browser receives the data, uh, again, the platform comes into picture. It will, you know, beautify the information and show us in the format that we are currently seeing. So everything is again tables and columns because we are talking about database, database, whenever, uh, you know, the database concept comes in, always remember that whatever is happening in the backend, it's always tables and columns. So inside a table, we might have multiple columns. Again, inside a table, we might have multiple rows. So columns are nothing but header. They are the field or the column label for any table. And records are nothing but multiple records that we are currently seeing here. You can say these are the columns, the number, short description, configuration item of the columns, and multiple incidents, multiple records are the ones that we define them as rows in the database. But we may not be touching all those. It's just for our understanding about what is service now and how it works in the backend. So quickly moving into understanding the navigation part. So as you log in, this is what the page you might go into. And at the top, you have the service now logo. So this is what we call it as a banner frame where you can actually change this banner from service now to anything that you, uh, you, know, you are requested to. So you might uh, get your request from your customers or clients to change this banner frame, uh, sorry, banner image from service now to the actual customer uh, name, and they might have their own logos. So we can go ahead and change this, but on a high level, the top frame that you're seeing here, that is little greenish blue. So this one is called the banner frame and all the navigation in the platform happens with the help of this banner. So the first one is nothing but all inside this, we actually have, you know, this is what we call the filter navigator. So we can navigate to all the applications by just scrolling through the system. I have a lot of applications, but by default, you know, you should also see all these coming up. You can sideload applications by going to, uh, you know, uh, service now store. We can install applications. You can install plugins from here that are already entitled to this instance, but. On a high level, these are the applications and functionalities that is available out of the box. So out of the box, whenever we use this terminology, it is actually coming with service now. So anything that you see available already in the instance, you call them out of the box. Out of the box, it is provided to us. So uh, don't get confused. It's it's very simple. Anything you say, uh, you know, you, we call uh, even out of the box tables. So which means these are the tables that are already available in the instance, and that's why we call them out of the box. So that being said, uh, filter navigator, anything we type, it will search the entire service now instance if there is an application menu or module configured for it, and it will show all of those here. And then we have the favorite section. Favorites, in most cases, let's say I, as an engineer, I work on incident change and all those on a daily basis. In that case, I can go ahead and mark the favorite. So for example, change is one more process. Let's say if I work on change on a daily basis, I can go ahead and click on the star option. So if you do this, everything under this particular application will be marked as favorite and the same will be available for us here in the favorites. I have a lot of favorites already added to so change. But yeah, on a high level, the change has come up. And 
and I can just go and play around it. But high level favorites are just for our understanding about how uh, you know frequently we use any application, and if you want them to be available for us a little quicker, uh, this is one way. And I can remove them from favorites by just clicking on X. This will remove this particular application with the confirmation from our favorites list. So adding and removing favorites, it's just um, with the click of a button and you can uh, achieve that. History, history talks about if you recollect five minutes ago, I just opened all the active incidents. So it takes time to show up the history, but this is almost similar to a browser history. So as and when you're working on the instance, all your activities will be tracked here. And uh, you know if you want to go back uh, to a couple of more uh, tabs back, but you have closed it, you have to go, you don't have to ideally look into the browser history. Everything will be tracked in the history section using which you can navigate to that particular record which you want to open up. So, and then workspaces. So, mostly workspaces are something where uh, any dedicated engineer will work. So, let's say I, as a uh, service operation team, I may need to work on the service operator workspace because uh, I uh, it's, it's a easier interface for me to open up multiple tickets and work on all the services that are currently operational. So for example, uh, it just takes some time, but we'll be able to see the reports, see what are the tasks that are assigned to me, and then get started with them right away. I don't need to, you know, wait, query through the instance, look into a specific data and then configure it. At this point in time, we don't have anything assigned to me. Uh, I can see that there are already seven audio tasks. You can click on it and observe that it does not actually open a new browser window. It just opens up a tab here and I can just work on them and then close them. So as and when I click on any record that I want to work, it's going to open up a new tab. It's not actually opening a browser tab. In this. this is a uh, approval request and I can just go ahead and approve or add my commands and do activities. This is just one such example, but any other task, let's say this is for an RITM, we'll understand what is RITM as we go, but if there is an incident, if there is any other task assigned to me, everything will be available for me in a single user interface using which I can easily work on it. But on a high level, this is available out of the box, I did not create any of them. So even if you log into your instance, you should see, you may not see this task. These tasks are something that I have been working on in the past. I mean, this is a completely new instance. You can, even if you procure, uh, if you start playing around, you may get all these tasks or incident uh, showing up for this particular user. Again, this is specific to user. So a different user logs in, he, uh, he or she may not uh, you know, see all these, but still, the workspace is available for them. And they can go ahead and uh, you know make use of it. Finally, clicking on the banner image always takes you to the home page. If you have any home page defined, it will take you. And for a developer instance, it's always going to take you to this app in studio home page. And finally, there are admin consoles. So as an admin, uh, you know I, I I'll be more concerned about the instant security, how many users are logging in, and if there are any threats available, if there are any apps that I need to install, upgrade, all those will be available for me in my admin console. You can call this admin console or admin home, admin home page, always spot home pages, and home pages usually contains that goes and reports. So reports, I mean, these are concepts uh, and features provided by servicemen, which helps us to you know, query the database, get the number, and then showcase it on the home page. This way, you'll get a nice uh, user interface on the uh, instance, and you can you know, click on the number and decide what you need. So these are very clickable options. You can just click on this. If it says instant security notification, there are 21 notifications that, as an admin, I need to review. So I can click on it. It'll take me to the page. It'll say me what are those 21 occurrences. Why, how come it gave me this report where the number is 21? So all these occurrences will come in. It talks about some admin login, security elevations, whatever has happened in the past. And I can look into it and decide what 
options I need to perform based on you know uh, the specific use case as part of the admin console. So that is all. And if you observe this page, uh, browsers usually allow you to go full screen. So when you go to full screen, you may not see what is at the top of the window. Uh, so if I navigate to incident, the name is going to change here and it becomes incident. So just what it is displaying on the browser tab. If you're in full screen, you may not see the URL or this particular top names for the tab. So that's why the names are replicated here for us, which you can view when you're in the full screen. And then we have this uh, search option. Using the search option, you can search the entire instance for any data. So for example, I can take this incident number and if I'm in a different page, I can always use this global search option. Go ahead and search, it will automatically give me the relevant data or I can click on view results. So if I click on the relevant data, it will take me to that record what I'm searching for. But if I go ahead and click on view results, it will show me all the other results that the instance has queried and it will show everything available for me. So at this point in time, the exact match is only on this incident. If this is currently used elsewhere, all those occurrences will be available for us with the global search. Finally, we have uh, the updates at an application picker. So there is a key concept called application scope in ServiceNow. By default, everything will be available in the global scope. Uh, but as a different feature, if you want, you can go ahead and install a different application. That application will be available in a different scope. So scoping is to say that, you know, when you go for projects, we define the scope of work, right? So similarly, I can create my own scope. I can define a limited work for it and define everything inside. An update set is another major concept where all your customizations and configurations gets captured with the update set using which you can either take it as a backup or move it to a higher instance for testing or you know go, going live to production. Yeah, this is one more concept. Uh, as and when a customer picks up uh, service now, they are provided with a minimum of three instances. One is developer instance, one is testing instance, and the next one is the production. So engineers usually work on development instances. And when, I'm, when we are working on the uh, development instances, we create the update set to capture our configurations and customizations. So all the scripts, uh, any changes that we make in the instance uh, for the properties or, uh, you know, if I go ahead and create a UI page, a business rule, all those gets captured in the update set. Then I can move to the test once my development activity is completed. So I can either uh, test it myself, do a peer review, or give it back to the uh, testing team who can perform rigorous testing on it. Once testing is completed, create a change window. Again, change window is already um, always required to make a production uh, push. So again, uh, the change team will review the changes. Uh, they, they'll give us a time frame in which this particular uh, changes should go into production. And during all those times, update set is the one that's going to help us. And then we have finally help sections. So we can define the help section as and when a user is stuck somewhere. They can always decide and, uh, you know, develop some help content and showcase it here so that they can easily navigate through the instance for uh, without any issues. And if there are any notifications pointed out to any engineer, let's say if this in this particular incident that we are talking is assigned to us probably we may see the notifications here. And there are also emails triggered by the system. So emails also go to any engineer uh, if a task or a ticket is assigned to them or created by them. Finally, we have the profile view. So you can view your profile, set the preference. Impersonate user is another major concept using which you can perform any testing. So right now we are a developer, but I have completed my development and I want to see how uh, this development looks like as an end user. So I can impersonate into an end user. Again, when it comes to an instance, 
uh, there are multiple roles n number of roles uh, but there are only three types of users when it comes to service now one is admin user who are developers who configure the instance the next one is it user who actually work on tickets and the final one is the end user so these are the three types of user that the instance usually has and as an admin it's pretty much straightforward we go ahead develop the instance write some scripts make some configurations all those are done by admin and end users are the one who consume the services so let's say uh, service so this particular service now is owned by a internet service provider and as a admin uh, the you know the client will request us the stakeholders will request us to uh, make a service request for a different plans so as a end user i log in into your uh, you know website that is service now we can create a interactive website also that is called service portal or ui pages so we can develop all those and uh, give it there but if i need to test i can impersonate into a end user and see how the look and feel is and again as a end user if i have requested a, a new service plan that again goes and gets assigned to a user who actually works on these tickets and these are called itl users so admins develop end users consume the development activity and then the particular uh, you know services are made operational by the itl users who are nothing but the users who work on the tickets raised by the end users and then finally elevate role uh, elevate role is another major concept where we play around with the security of the instance so ac uh, acls are the one that manage the uh, security here and that is called access control list and in order to configure them we need to elevate role so only a system administrator who has a security admin role will be able to elevate into a security admin user and then configure the acls we'll do that later uh, we're just trying to understand how the navigation works so once all this is done i can go ahead and log out so finally my work is done I can log out close the browser and finish my day that being said we are trying to understand how we can navigate into the system what is service now and then how the system works so let's quickly move towards how the list and form are configured and how do we you know navigate into the system and how do we use this list view and form views so in major cases list and form are the one that uh, you know any record that we are trying to target uh, we may be seeing them in either of these two views so looking into the instance uh, we'll take back to our incident example again so if i click on search for incident it shows up in the module and the one that we are seeing here is called the list view and if i open a new record this is what we call it as a form view so form view is nothing but all the detail information about a particular ticket and list view is nothing but all the information about a particular table that holds all the records in it and the list view we can go ahead and write some filters let's say i only want to see the incidents that are created by a dedicated user i can say who is the caller is so who is the caller for this incident and i can write table tutor so these are the filters i can go ahead run this filter i can save this filter for easier usage next time so incidents by able able is a very annoying person who creates a lot of incident for us so i can go ahead and create a filter for me that filter will be available here i can go ahead and say incidents by able right now this is the filter applied so if i'm elsewhere i navigate to my incident form if it is open incidents i can directly go ahead and select the created filter here and this is going to be incident by it so what exactly happens here is this filter gets applied automatically 
and i get an option to let's say uh, decide uh, based on the state i only want to see states that are new so i can go ahead and click on show matching so it will only show states that are new or i can remove this by removing the filter here i also have an option to do filter out so this filter outs the list that is not having the state as well so a couple of options are available in the list we can go ahead and uh, i can even uh, you know update some values so for example the short description is testing new save so i can go ahead and say testing the list view of incident table so this short description gets updated here i can also do a bulk update so if i want to update the state or let's say the description only i can select both of them enter i can say bulk update on short disk from this view so both incidents short description gets updated so bulk updates are allowed we can go ahead and uh, filter create some uh, custom filters i can click here to remove this filter i also have an option to group by so let's say i want to group by based on the state so we have additional column options and select group by state it will group by all this information i can expand this and use this i can click anywhere in the column option again i can ungroup and this is another and there are additional options that i can do so i can search here in the description i can do star star is a unique identifier for us where it's going to say any incident that contains short description as start and it already has a coming filter so it will only show able tutors caller with short description as test so i can go ahead and remove something in between in the filter also so if i click on this it will remove that filter it will show all the incidents that are currently active with the short description containing test so i can make similar searches anywhere in all the columns or i can go ahead and remove them and keep it default so i can sort it so if you see this particular number it is actually sorted from z to a if i click this it is sorted from a to z so based on the numbers based on the alphabets available it will try to sort either by ascending or descending and the key most uh, option that we have is if i select multiple record here i have an action that i can perform here the main, uh, main one is delete little preview archive records these are just you know in the back end it will go ahead and either archive this or delete this particular record i have an option to repair sls add this to visual task board or create application file all these are for you know visual purposes and if i have a custom application i can create an application file using which i can uh, you know load this as a demo rate there are options available for me to assign this as a task so if i am assigning this as a task uh, sorry assign uh, assign the tag uh, this goes and these two incident are going to be assigned for that particular tag tags are mainly intended for uh, custom reference purposes so if i want to quickly query this incident but uh, no two incident has a uh, you know same characters or same uh, references but i want to create a relationship between these two records so i can go ahead and create a custom tag by myself so i can click on new tag and create a tag myself or i can remove those existing tag option and feature that is available for us in the list view is personalizing the list view so we have an option here that is update personalized list and let's say if i want to go ahead and remove some columns from here i don't want to see the category and subcategory information i only want to see the subcategory i don't want to see the sort description so i can remove all this and click on okay so this will update the list view by removing all those columns 
and this is dedicated to this particular user so personalizing means it's personalizing for the particular user so it's it's, it's for a personal use it's not going to impact any other user so a different user if they log in they may still see the default columns that are configured for them but if you want to make change entirely for all the users in that case go ahead go for configure and then select list layout so any changes you make in the list layout which means this change is going to be global so all users will be impacted if i'm making changes here on the list layout so as a q tip as and when you get any requirement go ahead and do these changes on the list layout but if you're, it's only for your purpose, if you only want to see some data, if you don't want to see some data, prefer the personalized list option so that you don't you know, mess up the instincts. That being said, let's play around with the form now. Form is almost similar. All the data regarding the particular incident will be available for us here. And the form is split into multiple sections. The first one is the context menu. In the middle, we are seeing the contents. If I scroll down a little bit, I'm seeing the sections. So I can actually split the entire data into different sections that is available for me in the incident table. And I have more sections here. I can create my own section like this and add some additional columns into this. And if my incident is logically related to any of the other tables, I can bring them as a related list here. And we have these buttons. These buttons are called QA actions. So these actions are going to perform whatever activity that it is interacted. So if I want to delete this, I want to resolve this incident and update, all this happens with the help of this particular QA actions. And as I said, uh, there are two things when it comes to related. Related links, this is also a UA action. So anything that you see as a button or a link in the form, you can consider them as a UA action. And the way that it is configured is mainly based on whatever the request is. But again, these are just related links. This is the related list. Again, if there are any records related to this particular incident, that will be available in the list form, list view for us here. So if there are multiple records, all those will be available for us in the list view. So on the context menu, if I right click, we'll see all these different options. Uh, anywhere else I do this, uh, anywhere else I do this, I'll see the browser specific one. And if I right click on any columns, I'll see an option to configure that label, configure the dictionary, configure its style, and show more details about the particular column that I'm referring for. So apart from this, we have an option to add an attachment. So I can manage an attachment. I can download the existing ones, or I can choose a file and add new attachments to this. We have a more concept called activities to you. This will take us to what has happened in the history of this particular incident. So if I click on this, it will take me to the bug notes. It will show me all details that have happened in the past. So it says field changes are made on 11th of May, somewhere around 10 o'clock. And uh, similarly, an attachment was added to it around same time. So all those history will be available for us on the activity stream. I have an option to person based the form. So this is similar to personalizing the list. If I don't want to see some columns, I can go ahead and just, let's say, don't want to see active, click here, it vanishes from the form. And I click here, it appears again. So this is on a personalized form, so which means it is only for us as a personal user. But if I want to configure, I can go ahead and configure the form layout or form design and then bring the additional columns. I mean, Q-tip, make sure that you know if you don't do this kind of configuration until or unless you are requested and you know approvals are given from your management or the stakeholders, then go ahead and make this this way. Because these are going to impact on the users who are using this form.
So that's pretty much it uh, when it comes to form. We have the content, we have the section, we have the related links, UI actions, and related list on the form. So any changes that I make, let's say if I want to go ahead and update it, just update or the sort description, I can click on update. Although what happens, as and when I click on update, it updates the record and takes me back to the previous window which I have opened. So previously I was in this configure form layout section, so it has taken me to that window. So I can go back and test update save. Now observe, if I right click on the context menu and click on save, it re remains in the same place. So we don't navigate into a different window if you make any changes. So update and save, what they do is it will submit the record to the database. It will save the record in the database and it will take us to the previous window, which we have opened. So it assumes that we need to go back. So it goes back, but as and when you want to be remaining on the same place, right click on the context menu and click on save. So there are a lot more to see with what these options are, which will be seeing in the upcoming sessions. So that said, this is around list and forms. So going into user management, this is another very key concept when it comes to managing a user in service now. Because there are, as we talked, there are multiple users. We need to have dedicated users for specific activities. We need to have, you know, assign them to a group. Let's say uh, if they are, again, coming back to our example on the internet service provisioning, so there could be a group who are field engineers. There could be a group who are you know, front-facing team. There could be a team who do uh, you know, work on the tasks. There could be a group who does all the development activities. So I need to you know, differentiate these teams by creating multiple groups, assigning multiple uh, you know, accesses to those groups so that as and when they perform their activity, they, like, they can log in into the instance and give their updates. They need, they need to log in because they need to have a user account. So let's quickly go ahead and create a user. This is for user dot list. So this is the table name. And if I do the table name dot log list, it will open me in a new tab. Again, if it is a capital list. But on a high level, if you want to play around with users, navigate to user administrator, and then users, it also opens you the same list view. So as you start working with ServiceNow, get comfortable with the table name so that you can easily navigate by just doing the table name dot list, and then it just opens you the list view of the entire table. Now, user creations are in most cases automated. So as and when the instance is procured, the first project that uh, you'll be handling is uh, found, populating the foundation data. So foundation data needs to be populated uh, and these foundation data involve users, groups, roles, any CI records, any company information, all those needs to be populated first. And this usually happens if you recollect any organization, if you log in three months once or six months one, you get a notification saying your active directory password is expiring. So one more key concept that you know we can implement in service now is integrating with any of the existing database. So I don't have to you know go ahead and insert each and every user's record. So just this demo data that are around 600 users. In an organization, there could be 6,000, 60,000, 6 million. So on these users, I cannot go ahead and manually create, right? But if I already have an active directory for my particular organization, so I can integrate with that active directory, pull all the data and then populate it in service now, which can be used as a information and a user DB for us. So this is on the foundation data population about users. And if you're given a task to go ahead and create a user, first and foremost, you need to navigate into the user table. 
and then click on new. So you click on new, it will ask you to provide some username. You can go ahead and give demo. You know, you can, this is just a user ID. So demo.user2, then give demo, user2, then give some title on this, and give some email, demo.user2 at xample.com. Select some location, and hope we have about select some language mostly english date format time zone select something that is fine and we can give some details in most cases these are the minimum set of information that you need to give and we can go ahead and save this user now i'm sure that we have not created any password for this user yet so in order to create a password, we have a set password option. So click on set password, click on generate. It generates a password for us. See the password, no harm in it. You can copy the password, save it somewhere for reference, and then click on see your password. Observe that in the backend, it has saved the password and it is also set password reset to true. So what does it mean? The password that we have set is just for the one-time user for the log, user to log in. So if you remember any application that you log in, you know what happens is it will give you a one-time password and as and when you use the one-time password, it will take you back to the password reset page where you can set your own password. So we have created this demo user. I don't know the password, I have set the password copied it so i can go into an incognito window and open this instance and as i open this instance i can use demo.user2 and the password that i copied and it will show me change your password so i need to give the current password in the new password window we can go ahead and give anything for us And this particular user, if you recollect, we have not given this user any role. So his, this particular user is assumed as an end user. So any user who does not have any role, he, they may not have much applications to work with. So see, there are only five or four applications that they have access to. And in most cases, they can only go ahead and request the plans. So if I have a plan, as an internet service provider, they can open the portal and then request that plan. Well, let's go back to our window and give this user additional rules. And observe that password need reset is no longer checked because the user has already reset the password. So high level, this is about creating a user, setting the user and providing the credentials. So now, Let's create a group called network engineers. So whenever you need to create or configure something, always go for user management and then group. But if you're comfortable with the table name, you can always go type in the filter navigator the table name dot list and it'll take you to a different window. So navigate to the groups, click on new and keep the name network field engineer. Let's give it group ID. So anyone that are part of this group will be notified. Engineering sample doc. So I'll save this. And at this point in time, there are no users so i'll go ahead and add this user that we just created into our network field engineer group so demo user 2 go ahead and click on save observe that even if we save the user at this point in time may not have any roles so user role assignment 
that's happening based on what group this user is working in. So we can see that the user is part of this group and there are no roles yet. You can ideally go ahead and give the role directly to the user, but that's not the best practice. So roles are always given to groups like this. So you go ahead, edit roles in group, and let's give this group an ITL access so the engineer can work on any IT tickets raised for it. So this will be queued. Again, this all happens in the back end. It takes some time. You can refresh and change. As I when this is completed. So we can see the role is added to this group. And as in when the role is added to this group, all the users who are part of this group will actually get this role. There are no roles and go ahead and refresh this window. And you can observe that there are 35 roles that are actually added. But on a high level, we have given only ITL role, but why did this engineer get 35 as? If you look deep into the role, this role additionally contains multiple roles. And it's again cascading. So out of these 19 roles, one or two roles might have, might contain multiple roles again. So all this is based on the hierarchy. So if one role is containing multiple roles, I know all these multiple roles can have additional roles assigned on top of them. So anything that is related to ITI, all that role will be given to this instrument. So if I go ahead and click on edit, I'll only see ITI here and I'll see the other roles showing up. And again, we have not given the role uh, based on the user definition. We have given the role based on the group definition and that is the best practice of this. So if you go ahead and click edit here, I'll only see ITL. The rest of the 35 roles are coming from the dependent roles. That is what we call it as contained roles option. So now if we can look back into our ITI user and just refresh this page. This particular user at this point in time should have got multiple accesses, but it takes time. And this particular session, this user has logged in as a end user. So I need to kill the session. So to do that, log out, kill the window. And this is where we can now test using the option of impersonating. So I can impersonate into the user that we just created. This is our demo user too. Click on impersonate. So I don't have to ideally log in and check every time. I can just easily impersonate and observe that now this user has a lot more application accesses provided to me as part of the ideal role that was assigned to this particular user. So now you can see all the incident tables because you know they are given an ideal level access. You can go ahead and end impersonation, and we can go back to being an admin to perform a next set of activities. So when it comes to an instance, everything is actually configured with help of tables and columns. Any new feature that I'm going to provide, it is actually given with the help of tables. So in order to create a table, we need to go back again. If we look into the tables, there is a module called tables under system definition. This holds all the definition of whatever table that is available in the system. So for example, if you look into an incident table, we have three tables already, incident, incident task, and fact table. So open up, I can observe that in the URL, you have the table name, the backend name of this, this is sysdb object, and it is finishing with underscore list, which means this is ideally in the list view of it. So each and every table can be opened in a list view on form view. So currently we are in the list view, and I open this in a new record by, you can do control click, or you can do center click if you have a mouse option, it will open you in a new window. 
Observe that there's a name, label, and it says it is extending task table. So I can actually create a new table by extending any existing table so that all the columns that are part of the task table and features that are part of the task table will be inherited into the table that I'm creating. By default, this is on the global scope. We see the UI actions, we see columns, controls, and application accesses. We'll slowly move into it, but this is where the columns are coming in. And each and every column is called a dictionary entry because that is a table in which the columns reside. So I can open, uh, let's say, change request. And observe that this opens me in a new table. Right now, this is this TV object. And the table name changes to sys dictionary here as this record notes because this particular entry is available in the dictionary entry table. So let's go ahead and create our own table. So to do that, similar to what we did earlier, let's go to any table that you want to create, click on new, and we'll get started with our custom table. Again, uh, Always be cautious when you're creating any table because table creation has subscription impact. So as and when there is a request for you to go ahead and create a table, discuss about the subscription impacts because a customer may not, you know, only have a limited number of licenses procured for so many tables. So get those clarified. Try to reuse existing tables for most of the purposes. Uh, but at this point in time, you're just playing around so you can go ahead and create a table for yourself. So let's give this the name. I'm an internal service provider. So you can give service provision provisioning request. So the name automatically gets populated after that it gets prefixed with u underscore, which means this is not a system table. This is not coming out of the box. This is something that the user has created by themselves. So to denote that it goes u underscore. And there are places where you may see the table name as x underscore, which means it is inside a scope. So right now, when you are in a global scope, you may see only U underscore. We are not going to extend any table. Let's go ahead and create our own columns. So I can name this as plan. This is going to the label type. Sorry, column label type. We'll keep it string. And the max length, let's keep it not more than 40. I can create new, I can say, the price of this plan. This is also going to be string. There are multiple types available. I'll keep it simple and we'll save this. Look at the control now. This actually creates a new user with this specific rule. And uh, I'm not going to keep it extensible. We'll leave everything default. I can actually add auto number. I can say service provision request, I can give the number, how many digits is that? So this is where the numbering will come. We will see how this works. Application access, this also will leave default. Uh, we are deciding what all application can access our table. And right now we are only giving read access to all the other application scopes. And by default, even from a web service, this can be accessed. We'll slowly see how web services work. Ideally, you know, uh, web services are something that uh, uh, from uh, internet service provisioning, uh, all these can be integrated with third party system and consume this particular web service. So a third party system integrated into service now can actually read this data and we are giving that level of, uh, you know, access to it. Not just read, it can actually play around on this table via web services. We'll slowly see how web services work into picture and how things re resolve around, uh, you know, this application access that we are currently using. So after creating these two columns, we are going to leave everything to default and we can go ahead and save. 
it's going to create uh, some modules for us uh, with whatever name that we just gave and observe that apart from whatever columns that we have created the system has already created few more columns society is a major one because every record in service now needs to have a society because that is what is called a unique identifier for it and this is a 32 character value for society every record will have some society if i right click this column in the context menu we'll see copy society and this society will also be available in the browser or uh, url just after society that you're seeing here so this is the society of this record so society gets created for any record that you create and that's why society got created for this particular table if someone is trying to create a record into the table society needs to be populated also the auditing purpose it will also track who has created at what time it is created how many updates have happened to it after creation who has updated and at what time this has been updated we created two columns but we have also given an option to create the number so auto numbering already happens as and when we start creating this record. So we can open uh, one record and we'll do control click. It opens a new window and it gives more information about this dictionary entry for us. It says what table this particular column is related to and whether if this column is mandatory, read only, display, can be displayed on the form, the column label, what's the type of it, max length and all those. There is no choice involved in it. I'm not going to define any default one. And by default, there are no access controls on top of it. And label is just whatever that we have given here. But observe that in the back end, it has actually went ahead and created this role. So only users with this role will be able to perform operations such as also observe there are four access controls created out of the box to create, delete, read, and write. So it says, if you open one, and this operation is for create. So a user with the role defined in the access control, that is this role. This is the role that got created automatically. So a user with this role will be able to create record into this table. And similarly, only the user with that role will be able to delete, read, and write on this particular table. And observe that admin override is selected for it. In the backend, it is actually tick. So if admin override is selected, which means this particular rule does not get honored for admin users. We can go back to any of our window. We can refresh. Let me go ahead and refresh. We'll try to see our service provisioning table in here because we have created modules for it. So let's go ahead and search for service provisioning. And this is the one that we just created. Let's mark it favorites. Go to service provisioning. Since I'm an admin, I'll be able to see the service provisioning in the list view. And since I'm an admin, I'm having overridden access for either to create, read, write, or delete. So I can say I need six months plan, bronze. And I'm the directly populating the price by myself. I can submit this. So a record gets created. Now let's go ahead and play around with our groups here. So we'll go back to our group. That is our group. I think I closed it. Yeah, this user is here. From here, I can navigate to the group. I'll go to the network engineer group and I'll add this new role to this user. So for now, before I add this new role, let's impersonate and see if this user is able to access this provisioning table. So let us go ahead, impersonate into demo user 2, 
that we created earlier. And then first and foremost, we'll just check in the application navigator if we are able to see our service provisioning is not available here. I already have this open somewhere in the browser. And I'm currently logged in as a demo user. So I'll go ahead and refresh this. Observe that security constraints prevent access to the requested page because I'm a demo user who does not have sufficient roles. So how do we give the role? Go back to this and I need to first end the impersonation. Only as an admin user, I'll be able to configure all this. So I need to edit this and add the newly created group in this section. So it starts with U underscore, pretty understandable. Go ahead and give this role. Now, let us impersonate back into our demo user. So I need to end the impersonation. Let me open up this provisioning record. And I'm still admin, but if I impersonate into our demo user, now since the demo user has all these roles, this user should be able to view and play around our service provisioning table. So now this is visible for this user. This user can go ahead and create a record, update an existing record, read, we are actually reading the data. So we can do this or at worst case, this user can go ahead and delete this record. So it's sufficient access. This is how ACLs work. I can create ACL, but by default, when we create a table, four ACLs get created along with it. Also, a new role gets created along with the table creation. So tables and columns, that's how it works. As a menu created table, it creates application menu and module for it. It also creates a role. It also creates six different columns. And finally, four new access controls with the role that was defined during the creation part. So access control plays a very major role in all these. So that is why access controls are only given to security admins. And even for security admins, every time they need to work, they need to elevate themselves into a security admin role so that they can either update or you know make any changes to it. See right now, all this is read only. Since I'm elevated into a security admin role, I'll be able to update or delete these ACLs. Let's take some time because I elevated myself and we are seeing this now. I can remove this role, I can add this role, I can delete, you know, I can change these operations. So and so can be done on the ACLs. So this is on user management, playing around with tables and columns, accessing the tables, uh, and uh, configuring the ACLs and other parts. So the next thing that we'll be looking into is importing the data and then updates it. So in most cases, we need to populate data and we saw user data being one of the foundation data that needs to be populated. And again, if there are one or two records, I can go ahead and manually do them. But if there are, let's say hundreds of data, hundreds of records, how are we going to populate them? And what is the simplest way? What are different options and features available in service now? First and foremost is data source and transformer, and then integrations. There are a lot more to these two things, just with what the name says. So going back to our instance, let us now take this data about our service provisioning. 
Let me refresh. We have our instance here, and we have this service provisioning request. So right now we have only one record here. What I can do is to take the sample, I can click on the column options, click on export and go for an Excel format. It takes some time, allow the time and go ahead and download this, save it somewhere. And then now we need to edit this. So I'll load this somewhere again. And uh, you know we need Excel to actually uh, edit these columns. Again, what we are going to do, we are writing, going to write some data into this Excel sheet and then upload them back into the instance. And we'll see how this can be uploaded. So as and when you have uh, any data that you want to populate, the first thing you need to do is go ahead and export that data so that you can see. So right now, this is the one that we have exported. So exported data looks something like this. Then we have the service numbers. These are automated. So I'm going to create some 10 records here and we'll see how we can import these 10 records back into the service number system. So let's go for 10 entries and update the numbers. Three, this one is four and five, six, six seven, eight, nine, finally, 10. So the first data is already available in the instance. So I can actually remove this. You no longer need it. So let's go ahead and delete this row. And the plan, I'm gonna randomly type some data. Gold, silver, bronze, platinum, gold, silver, platinum. Silver. Total price, let's again, I'm gonna write some random values. Once we have this, we can go ahead and save this again as an Excel. So I'm gonna download this, gonna keep it somewhere. This is the one that we recently downloaded. So we have our data now. How do we go ahead and import them into the instance? So I'll refresh this just to show you how many data we have. We have only one. So in order to import, the first thing we need to do is define a data source in the platform. So navigate to system import set, data source, Same, just like how we created a table, go ahead and click on new, give a name, say that you're going to import service provisioning data. Let's give a name, service provision import. The label automatically comes up. The, we are going to do file type and these are the other formats that data source allows. To keep it simple, the one we are going to do is Excel. We are having only one sheet and the header row is one because that's where the column entries are available. And we are going to use a file retrieval method as attachment. So we'll go ahead and save this record first. And then we'll attach a new data sheet into this particular record that we just created. So the one we created is this one. Selected, close this. And the next thing we need to do is define where this data is going to reside. 
So this is our import set table. This is a temporary table. You can call it as a staging area where all the data from the Excel sheet gets stored here. And this is where we process the data. After processing, we move to the target table. Our target table here is nothing but a service provision table. And I'll reload to you again, no data here. Still, this is like this. And we can go ahead and perform transform. So transform maps are the one that are going to help us in transforming the data from our Excel sheet, from our import set table into our target table. So I can say provision data map. My target table here is my provisioning table. So you can see search for a table name, leave everything default. Let's go on, save this now. So just duplicate this. We need to go back to our data source now. Load the data. So to load the data from the Excel sheet into our temporary table, we have an option for load all records. So first load all records. This will load all the record from our Excel sheet into our staging table. Once this is completed, we have an option here to do field mappings. So let us go ahead and refresh this. Reload the form. Yeah, we have an option again here to reload. We have an option to do field mappings. Now we need to perform field mapping. So we have three different fields available. So we can go ahead and map all those from the parent table to the target table. So the source field for us is plan. So the first thing is plan, plan to plan. So we'll do this and submit. Go back to our transform map. And then add the additional two more field mappings that are available for us. And then now observe that you get an option to automatically map the fields. So this works only if the source and the target are having common field names. And you can see that it mapped the number and plan by itself. So next thing I need to do now is we have the data source available, transform map created, field mapping is also done. So I can finally go ahead and transform this. It will ask us which imports a table and which transform map to work. In our scenario, everything is just one. We imported only one data. We are having only one transform map. So it automatically selected both of them. And then it is asking us for a confirmation. So data is data transform is completed. We are seeing completed message. Fingers crossed. Let's refresh before we see the data coming up here. So that is pretty much it. Data source and transform map are very much straightforward. And the one that we did is we exported the data to see how it may look like. So you can use it as a template, add additional data attach that by creating a new data source, load all that data from the data source into the input set table. Upon loading, create a transform map and on the transform map, define the relationship between your import set table to your target table. And after defining, go ahead and uh, do the uh, transformation. And once transformation is complete, all the data will be available here. There are multiple ways to do this. You know, you can go ahead and do a file retrieval method. You can set up an integration. You can query a database, get the database value, and then populate. So and so happens. And this is how the AD integration also happens when the user data needs to be, uh, you know, populated. Either I can do it with the help of Excel sheet, or I can perform integrations. So this is on populating the data with the help of transform maps. So I'm gonna close this. And, and all this. In the back end, what might have happened? So I earlier during our session, probably you would have not seen this, but I have went ahead and created an update set. So what is an update set? We saw that this is the one that is going to capture all our changes. So I have already created one. 
but i'll show you how we can create new similar to how we did table creation data source creation navigate to local update sets click on new and give a name that is user understandable so in most cases when you are working on the configuration we can give the application name something like you know you can see service provisioning configurations so i can give any such name i can click on submit and make current so what happens now is it would have created an update set and it will make that update set as a current update set so that whatever configurations that we do everything gets stored in the update set and i can later move that update set but i have already created one earlier and so that this has captured all the changes that i have been performing from the beginning of a session so what i did again in the customer updates you can right click the filter open in the new tab and if we sort it by created we'll see that we created a new table earlier today we created some data source transform map all those we created today this is our transform map as a yeah this is the transform map name this is our import set table name and this is the table that we created service provisioning request all this gets stacked in the update set so what good does it do so we can simply complete this save this and then export this as an excel so what happens when i export it? let's say i have went ahead and accidentally deleted the some of my transform maps so let's say this transform map uh, which was that uh, we created recently i've deleted this by mistake so assuming that this is deleted by mistake there are ways that we can retrieve this one i exported my update set correct this update set holds my transform map and field mapping so i can go ahead and import that and this is the same way let's say if my development is complete if i want to import my changes from one instance to another instance so i export this from my development instance i move to a test instance and i search for retrieve update sets and in retrieve update sets you have an option to import so we can import whichever one that we just downloaded so as you import it will ask to preview this one this is the one that we just loaded the state is loaded we can preview this update set it will try to compare with all the data that is available in the instance and it will show if there are any errors and it says there are four collisions 44 updates and two inserts so what i can do is it says these transform map and entry are not available so i'll go ahead and select all of them and i'll say accept the remote updates so when i do that it has fixed all the issue and now i can commit this update set so whatever that i have taken as a backup everything will be available for me here and in case of moving this to a new instance everything will again be available for me in my test instance about whatever that i have developed so the update side works both way either you take a backup or you want to take and move it to a different instance either way this works and just to show you we should be having back our update sets if i go back to our data source so we have this data source i have deleted this transform map just before some time but if we look into our data source we should be seeing our transform maps showing up because we have retrieved them with the import uh, updates at option and here we go here's a transform map we deleted this along with the field map but this has come up again because we have retrieved this data so this is around playing with the data source input set and update set information about how we can utilize for loading the te temporary data 
taking a backup and then moving it to a new instance so so far uh, we've been seeing about what is service now we try to understand how the platform works we are trying to uh, you know look into what is a list and form and all those so uh, quick recap we it's about uh, the service now is being a java application posted somewhere it has an application node couple of databases primary and secondary for uh, failover scenarios then we looked into user management we saw how we can create a user assign that user to a dedicated group and then we gave the role to the group and that's the best practice we also created our dedicated tables using which we played around with some of the access control concepts again uh, any time whenever there is a request on any form uh, the first thing that happens is the acl gets evaluated here and if a match is found it tries to go through all the conditions and scripts written on top of the acl first it checks the role and the condition and then if there are any scripts written and if all these are satisfied then it grants the user to view the table if not we saw that it used to throw some security constraint error again if a user is not satisfying all those it's going to deny the user with saying that security constraints so apart from that we saw uh, how we can import data so data import happens ideally in most cases with the help of an attachment or integrations all those works in place and in our scenario we looked into loading data with the help of a template so we created a table we exported a single data which we created manually uh, and we use that as a template for us to import this data back into service now so the next important thing that uh, we would be seeing is how do we notify this user so let's say right now we have our custom table so in most cases service now instances are configured to send out emails uh in personal developer machines uh, that is in our uh, uh, you know procuring an instance uh, for testing purposes or for your own uh, activities you uh, sending out emails are disabled by default but whenever you you know on a customer instance service now always has a email box configured so which means it can the instance can actually send out emails and receive incoming emails and we can decide what to do and how we can configure that do we need to send out emails and what happens when we receive emails going back to this let us check our table right now so we created so this provisioning request and we loaded all this data right so as and when there is service provisioning request let us try to go ahead and create a notification for this so how do we do again you can go for additional actions one figure at the bottom you have notifications you can go ahead see that currently there are no notification configured for this particular table so we can go ahead and configure a new notification and we can decide what are the contents that we can actually send so i'm going to say that this notification is about provisioning information so i can just service provision notification the table gets automatically populated because i am actually configuring it from the table category will leave it default and then there are three sections for us here when do we send this we can send it during record insert or updated and in our scenario i'm going to just select insert so as and when a service provisioning request is created we can define this to get triggered. and there are other ways to actually trigger this this is the trigger point where the notifications are fired so event is fired and there is some more concept called triggered so we'll keep it simple record insert or updated and i can actually set some conditions so conditions meaning only you know i don't need to send this for all users so i can just keep it to uh, a dedicated group or only if a record matches certain condition like you know notification need to be sent only to platinum members or things like that 
we can configure those conditions. So this is the trigger point. The next is, this is where we decide who do we send this. So we can write some script, set all those values, go to the advanced view and uh, you know uh, perform all this, but we'll keep it simple. We have the groups, we have the users created. Ideally, who should this notification go? Whoever is making the service request. So in that case, we can dynamically uh, you know, try and uh, add this in here, what it will contain. In the content section, we can add uh, from script, like who we can send, but for this example, we'll keep it simple. So we'll give the user that uh, we created. So our demo users can go with this one and close this. So what will happen is in time, this notification is triggered it will always go to the demo user. I mean, for testing purposes, you cannot actually send an email to end users, right? So uh, when you are working on notifications, make sure that you have a dedicated test box or a test email box to which you can always trigger this email for testing purpose. And then you can go ahead and manually add the group. So let's say if in the service provisioning box, if I have a field, so right now we had plan, total price and all those. So I can add a field that says user and get the user data here and then select the user's email box from this. So that way it becomes dynamic. So I can do this way or I can write some scripts. So we are deciding that we are going to send it for a test user. So as and when anybody creates a provision request, it always goes to this test box that is going to be demo user too. And then email template, ideally if you observe every email will have some unsubscribe and uh, preferences at the bottom of any email. So this gets added automatically. We can create our own email templates and then do this, but again, we'll keep those things default and we'll move on. So let's go for the subject. Here's your provision request. I can actually give the request number. So these are the fields that will be available for us. Right now I need to just give the number. So I can select this. The number can also be selected from here. Your service question number is so and so. Just for for the preference. The opted plan is this opted plan is this and the total premium. So the plan is this. So I can give it this way. I can let us just get it and feel. And again, as and when I type here in the message HTML content, in the back end, what happens is it actually converts this into a HTML code. So this becomes like this. I can make it more intuitive. I can add some table. We can you know change the text color add the formats, attach some links, videos, all these are available, but we'll keep it as simple as possible to get started on seeing how this notification works. So we are adding this, we are provisioning all these details and then I can say any queries, contact support at example.com. That's pretty much it. Let's go ahead and save this. And now as and when we create a service request, this particular configuration will trigger emails. So test that. Let us first go look into our email logs. The email logs will give us a high level information about what all emails that has been sent out from the system. So we can go ahead and create our provisioning request. 
Here we have this. Let us go ahead and create something new. So I'll change the number. Let's give the plan to the total price. It is going to be this. And let us save this. So the provisioning request is saved. And right now, the assumption is as soon as this is saved, that is created, or a record is inserted, an email should have been triggered. And that is what we are seeing here. This is the one that just got created. We can open this. Here's the subject that we gave. So the subject is just the one that we have provisioned here. Here's a provision request. It has given the provision request number. And the body right now is in the HTML format. So in the email log, we can actually see what is happening. The type is sent ready because, as I said, sending out from the machine is, you know, the personal developer instance is not enabled. Uh, mostly, I believe it's from the service you no know, feature side. But in your uh, customer instances, if we have email configured, this will go ahead and show out emails to whatever email ID that we are giving here in the recipient list. You can see what has triggered. This is the notification that we just created. The email log gives us, and if there are any attachments, that goes and gets added here. We have an option to preview our email. So our email might look something like this. This is the template, and observe that there is a watermark added for unique identifications. So the provision number is, again, the number comes dynamically. And the opted plan right now, we have selected platinum and it has also given the total price. And again, we can actually do a mail to support our clicking it. It will open our email box and we can write some emails. So this is around sending out emails from ServiceNow based on whatever configurations that we are providing here. And again, I, I can send the email, I can configure it unupdated or we can write some trigger conditions also. So those conditions are nothing but events. Those are called events. So there are two types of events. One completely dependent on event management and other systems. And the other one is the core platform feature that is provided for triggering emails. So the one let's forget that there is nothing called event management at this point in time. We are only focusing on the platform feature that is event. As and when there is an event fired, this notification gets triggered. So in the backend, we also have event fired option. So I can script it in a scripted way. I can fire an event. And when that event is fired, this notification can be uh, you know, triggered. So if we look at events, even for the one that we just created, this should be on the system policy events. And if we look at the event logs, in the back end, it has actually triggered an event. See this, this particular one, notification engine process, it has actually fired this specific event to trigger our notification that we have configured. And since the event is fired, the notification is triggered, the emails is sent out. These are the details and this is the event name, notification engine process. So by default, whenever any event is configured in a way that record is inserted or updated, it fires this notification engine process event. And since this event is processed, it gets all this data from this place, whatever that we have configured, it sets these values here. And then once this is, once this is processed, we have a state, it will fire notifications. Similarly, uh, when it comes to email coming inside service now, there are ways that we can decide what it needs to do. So we have an inbound email and there are inbound actions. So in an inbound action, I can decide what to do with any email. In most cases, whenever there's an email coming in and if you know we are uh, the user is allowed to create, again, uh, there are domain policies defined on the property level. So we can allow only certain companies to send email to this service now instance on a property level. 
and we can see this configuration as and when there is a email coming into service now's inbox it will go ahead and create an incident so the target table is this action type is record action and it is good and creating a new table oh, sorry a new record in the incident table the informations and actions this is where the field mapping between the event body and the current values on the table comes into picture and it's just the inbound action if you want email processing to happen this is the place that we need to go ahead and configure it so this is all about configuring notifications and playing around with instances email notification so as and when a particular condition is satisfied we can send out the emails and we can also process the emails when it is sent to the instance we can uh, do write our own inbound email action and then decide what that email should do should it create an incident should it create a custom record all those can be configured so next thing that we are going to see is another important concept around service catalogs so we have three main concepts inside service catalog one is items called the maintain items second one is order guides and the next one is record producer so what are these service catalog actually so consider this as a uh, you know when you step into restaurants you get the menu right so it's almost relevant to that service catalog is a menu of items what the company can offer to end users so this is where i go ahead and uh, you know create my uh, plan so i can go ahead and create uh, some records keep that to the end users consumption and the end user you know from service portal or if they have access to service now they can log in and create a request based on whatever that uh, you know we are provisioning so service catalog is like a menu which has a list of items that i can offer and this is done for the help of maintain items record producers and order guides and all these are in the back end driven by workflows and flow designers so flow designer is the latest concept i can say workflow is already become legacy but the platform still supports both workflow and flow designer flow designer has the latest ui features uh, the look and feel is good anything that we can do in workflow can be done in a flow designer but flow designer has additional features uh, like actions um, and uh, reusable actions which you know creating custom activity which is little easier and those things cannot actually be done in a workflow so you'll have to uh, you know stick with flow designer uh, whenever you have those kind of requirements so get comfortable with using uh, flow designer because this is the latest one and uh, any new uh, you know requirements that you are put forth flow designer is the first thing that you should look into when you want to do a sequence of activities because this is what it de defines what happens to the request so as a end user i go ahead and request something what should happen in the back and i cannot script everything right so i can write a flow i can ask the particular request to go through the flow that we are defining so let us go ahead and uh, look into it maintain items order guide and record producer are the three different features or you can also say types that you have in the service catalog maintain items are directly the one that um, you can see it in the portal right away so you can go to service portal and this is kind of the ui that a end user is expected to see as and when the end user logs in we can show this particular portal page for the end user because they may not be comfortable with this particular interface whatever that we are logging so uh, admin and itl user can have this interface but for an end user it is preferred to have portal i have request something option so if i go ahead and request something all the items that are configured for me will be available so if i want to get a apple iphone request if i want a power bank supply and let's say if i want something related to hardware i can go ahead and check for hardware items that are currently provisioned by this organization so i can go ahead and make these requests 
all these requests will have their own workflows. So for example, let's say I go ahead and uh, yeah, raise this Apple iPhone 13 request. This is an item actually. So when I click this, it'll take me to a page where I can raise this particular request. And let's say this is a replacement for a lost phone. I'm gonna say no. Monthly data elements, I'm gonna go unlimited. Let's say I want product red and we'll go with 50 GB. So if we have got all these, and observe that the total price has gone jacked up to $1,100. And the delivery type is also given. You can add this to cart or I can directly go ahead and order. So let's go ahead and order. So order confirmation, again, this is for me. And if I want to give any additional information, I can go ahead and give all these. So let us go ahead and check this out. So now that we have placed this order, we have this request now. So observe that this is the request. Whenever a request is created, we have three items, three different records actually working in the backend. One is request, second is the actual request or item that has been requested. And the third one is what happens in the backend when someone requests. So someone has to go ahead and you know check in the stock room if the device is available or not, and then deliver it to the user, right? These are all the different tasks related to the item. So request, requested item, and task are the three things that happens whenever a request is raised. So let's look at the request table. So we have my request. I am just gonna open this. Currently we are in my request view. Let's move to default view. You can see the 11 is here. This is the one that we just requested. So if we open this request, you can currently see that this will be pending approval because the price is around too much. And you can see who is the approver here. Just on a high level to look at it, it is the workflow that is helping in the back end to follow this process. We also see requested item here. And the requested item is currently pending for approval on the request side. So nothing else can be done at this point in time because it is waiting for approval on the request level. So what we can do, uh, we can check on show workflow. This will show the current status of this particular workflow. We are not actually opening the workflow. This is the workflow that is happening for this particular record. So as and when uh, this gets created, we can see that this is currently waiting for approval. And we also see the approvers here. So I can open this. And since I'm an administrator, I can actually approve from here. Ideally, Eric should log in and approve this. Since we are playing around, let's go ahead and see this. I'll just refresh this. You can see that the particular request is approved and this section is ended. And the same will get reflected in the RITM. The stage is on fulfillment. So which means it is approved and the next set of workflow activity are getting triggered. I mean, that is a workflow for the request. And for each and every item, there will be a dedicated workflow. For request, this is always going to be the workflow in this particular instance. And when it is RITM, every different item will have its own workflow. For example, we can go ahead and look at this workflow. We can see that this one is particularly, you know, procurement is not turned on. So it has already went on fulfillment process. So when the fulfillment process is kicked in, there is a task created for it. And it says order from MNDAR or movement from install. So this is a task that we go for a dedicated team. And these are the three items, uh, so three different records that comes in the picture. So request, request item, and task. Task is the actual activity where a user actually uh, you know, goes ahead and work. So 
I'm going to assign it to some group, I believe. Okay, we need to check for whom we can assign. So let us go ahead, check for users. At this point in time, we're not having any users. So let's go ahead and just close this. So now, assumption is we have ordered from Mendar, or you know, there is a stock available, and I have moved that into stock. And we have one more task here. This task is around receiving the item. Again, I'm going to go back to our workflow. If we refresh, it will honor this. Once this is fulfilled, it is awaiting delivery. And once the delivery is confirmed, that is the delivery is actually happening to me. I'm procuring it from my inventory. Come inventory, I'm taking this to uh, my organization. And once it is there with me, I'll go ahead and close this. I'm saying that I have received this item and let's go ahead and configure this meeting. As in when you request some device in your organization, right? It needs to go through certain configuration processes. They'll set up VPN, they'll set up you know, some tracking uh, tools to make sure, you know, even if it is lost, it can be found out and those things can be configured. Assuming that this is done, you can close this. And finally, now this needs to go to your desk. That's where again field services will come in. This needs to get delivered to the customer whoever, whoever has requested it. So again, the workflow will get updated every time whenever there are activities done. You go to this, you can see that this is already there. And then next activity is nothing but completed. And relevant states will get updated on the RATM. But at this point in time, we can just go ahead and close this one. So the flow of the service catalog is similar. The one that we have been talking about is the item. You can actually look into the item. This item looks like this. So we can go ahead and uh, create this. You can say configure item. So similarly, how we created a table, uh, we can actually go ahead and uh, configure it by navigating to maintain items table. So you go to maintain items table, the table name is SC cat item. Click on new, give names, fill all these details. You can actually take this for reference. Some demo data will be available. Give the variables needed and all those. So we'll quickly create one, but we're not going to create this particular thing where uh, we need to uh, you know, create the workflow and all those. We'll create workflows for a different use case and uh, you can see how it works. But on a high level, you can open maintain items, look into what all items it already has. You can reuse one of them and then uh, you know, uh, get an idea about how things work. So this is on maintain items. Let us open the workflow editor also. So if you have all it will showcase us all the workflow that is currently available for us, which you can either reuse or create something from scratch. Pretty simple. I can go ahead and create a new workflow, or else we see all the workflows that are already readily available for me, which I can go ahead and reuse. So this is one custom workflow. Clicking on it will actually open it. You can always send it for approval and then create a task. So Workflow mostly whatever activities that you want to add, everything will be available here. Approvals, rollback, some custom activities you can go ahead and define. And uh, all those will get honored at the time of RATM creations. So these are the different items mostly available out of the box. Uh, we can uh, you know, open, get through this. Everything that is defined here in the maintain items will be available for us in the portal for consumption. So next thing is, let us talk about order guides and record produce, record produce is the one that we'll be creating. But order guide is one more feature that is provided as part of the service catalog, which allows us to do a bulk order. So what happens is when I create one item, it actually creates multiple item in the backend. So we have this new hire. Observe what happens when I go ahead and uh, search for new hire. So I can search new hire, new hire from the order guide is available. As and when the new hire is selected, 
you know, I can decide which group this person to, should join. Let's say development, and then click on next. It'll ask me what all options does this new I need. He needs a laptop, he needs a monitor, a new account needs to be created, VPN. So all these are different items in the backend action. So you see the standard laptop. If we go ahead and search in our catalog, we might have that as a separate item here. Uh, it's better if we go into this. So this particular order guide is capable of creating multiple requests as and when a single request is placed and everything will be configured here for us. So once we have this, it is said that it needs to create a bulk order. We have all the variables, we have the rule base here, all the items are actually available for me. This, so standard laptop, this is a dedicated item. Observe this is catalog item guide. And observe the table name, this is catalog item. So all these are defined as a single item. And if configured on an order guide, it can create a multiple request for us. I'll just go ahead and place this. You give us a summary. Got the summary. Now let's go ahead and model this. So it's going to be the same. A request would have been created. We need to check this request table. So we can directly go out to the URL, do a list. This will open the list view. Open this request and approve it. At this point in time, it is waiting for approval. Let us right click here and approve. This will approve this request. And I can see already there are five items that this has created. So order guide is something that will allow us to create bulk orders if one order is placed. And all these items will have its own workflow. So if I open you know, this one and this one, they, both of these items will have its own dedicated workflow. So items will have dedicated workflow because we'll have a single workflow. You can see that this is procurement flow. Ideally, everything follows this procurement flow. And hopefully even this one follows this procurement flow. Yeah, this is service catalog item because so it is already there. It needs to go through all these approvals. So most items will have its own flow, and then we can define as and then uh, there is a flow required. If you need to customize, you can go ahead and do that. So we'll quickly see. Um, we'll play around with flow designers and all those. At that point in time, we might get some more idea. So let's go ahead and create a record producer for us now. We saw what is a catalog item that is a maintain item we saw order guide now we need a record producer to create our service provisioning request so navigate to record producers go ahead and click on new now let's go ahead and create a record producer record producer is something that you know allows you to create a record in any desired table So I can say create and request the table that is going to be what we are going to select is you underscore service provisioning request is our table name. I can leave everything as default. Let's go ahead and add some description. Use this to create service request. Description. This allows to create a internet service request. And assign engineers to work on it. So you're going to redirect to this data task, and this is a simple script. 
which we can use it to uh, you know decide what happens when this record producer is used. So I'm going to keep it simple and save this. Now we need to add this to a place in our portal, right? So you can see in our portal right now, I can place this somewhere in our request. So the request service has some categories and catalogs. So inside this category, probably you can go ahead and say, let's say, right we'll just put it in, can we help categories? So we can decide where this should be available. Let's say this is service request. So we'll keep it in service catalog. The category is, let's say, can we help? Placing this here, I'll keep portal settings. Let's hire attachments and all those. I'm going to quickly save this. So once I do that, observe that as and when I click on can we help section, The one that we created will start showing up. Item designer, internal plan, password request. Yeah, create provision request, the second one. Use this request to create service request. So this is the one that we just created. And at this point in time, we don't have any data mapping. This allows to create a service request and as an engineer to open. This is the one that we did. And I'll quickly open our service provisioning request just to show you what happens. So now we have 11 records. So if I go ahead and uh, click on this, it'll actually create me a new record. This one gets created and we can look into this. And I can see there are 12 records at this point in time. So now, what I need is if I look at the 12th record that just got created, which is this one, let's pull in some more data. Let's say created, we'll sort this created, and then we can see that this is just not created and the data is actually empty. There is no plan detail, there is no price information, and all those. So I can go ahead and create some variables to showcase that. So we don't need number information. Number will get automatically populated. All we need is to directly map the field to plan and then total price. A single line text, keep the order as, let's always go by hundreds. The one that we need is plan. I can just say plan. Okay, submit this. So let's go back to our provision request. Let's add one more column that is going to have the uh, pricing information. So go ahead and click on new map this to a field. This order is going to be 200. Let's map this to total price. Total price done. So we have created two variables here and we have mapped it to the fields on the table. So let's go ahead and refresh our portal and go back to service request. Picking on the uh, banner, it will take you to the home page. Go to request something, click on can we help. Create portion request will be available here. And this ideally have plan and total price details now. Go ahead and give this. And then let's give total price as this. Submitting this will take us to a new page. It says, let's create a new request. So just to verify that, we go back to our service request table. You can see zero five is created. Diamond is the one I gave. This is the price. And checking the history, this is the one that is has created. So at the uh, you know, parallelly, uh, if we actually look into our emails, we have configured the notification to send some emails. So this would have triggered an email. Here we can see, yes, a provision request. 
and this is the one that just got created. So our emails work, we can see uh, record producers are working and this is where the service catalog will come into picture. So there are many such use cases which we can use and everything follows its own uh, workflow. We can create our own workflows and flow designers to honor this particular request. So quickly moving on to the scripting part. Uh, so for this example, we'll directly dive in into an integration, which will help you understand all these concepts. So what are we going to do? Again, on a high level, whenever you're working with scripts, this is the execution that ideally happens. So this is the flow of scripts as and when you load a form, server side operation happens, it queries the DB, and then the business rules run parallelly with client scripts. So here we are seeing the uh, form request, server side and client side operation. So we need to understand this difference first. So here are two different types of scripts, server side and client side. So server side scripting ideally means all these operations are happening on the database on the instance, so which means either create or query, uh, the query is nothing but reading the data, creating and inserting your uh, record in the DP, updating or deleting. All these are considered server side operations. And client side is nothing but the browser side. So on the browser side, as and when, let's say if I want to show a pop up, if I want to validate the data, if I want to, you know, auto populate some information, I can do all those in the form that is on the browser with the help of client scripts. And the execution goes this way. As when you request something, the database is queried and it checks for any server side rules. And in most cases, ACLs will come into picture. We saw ACL earlier. So it will check if the user has sufficient roles. If the user has roles, first the client side operations are processed. And then all the you know, transaction is returned to the user interactions. Once everything is done and the form is loaded, it runs the next set of you know, server side operation. If it checks for uh, any query business rules, any workflows that it need to trigger. And once all this is done, it again makes a database query. So when it makes a database query again, the database query ideally reloads the table, uh, sorry, re reloads the tab on the browser tab. As and when the tab is reloaded, the same process goes again. It makes a DB query, checks for any displays, uh, display BRs, checks the ACL rules. And if all the rules are validated, fine, it runs the sequence of operations again, checks for any business, uh, sorry, any client side rules. And all those client side scripts are going to get reflected in the user interface and then it goes this way. So the sequence repeats every time the flow happens this way. So first thing is uh, a server side rule, which is nothing but a query business rule works as and when the form is loaded. After that, a display BR happens, then ACLs are evaluated, then client scripts are evaluated. The user is updated about the client side operations, whatever is done. And then if the user makes any changes, Similarly, database operation repeats. It evaluates, you know, if there is a workflow that needs to trigger or if there is a UI action operation that is happening, all those works and then the operation repeats. It queries the DB, it checks for ACL, client scripts are evaluated and this is the high level flow of how the scripts are working. So let's quickly jump on into an integration concept using which, you know, whatever that we have discussed, we'll try to utilize all the scripts and then we'll come up with the integration. So I'll quickly show how this works and then we'll see how we can configure them on our instance. So in most cases, whenever there's an integration in place, it actually happens. And in this case, we're actually using chat GPT in our scenario. I have already created some account. Uh, I've made this integration work. And uh, we are going to see how we can uh, replicate this. At this point in time, uh, we are using virtual agent. So click on this virtual agent. Uh, again, this works only on portal because virtual agents are available here. It pops up a window and it asks us, I'm your virtual agent, what can I do for you? First things first, we have show me a thing and I have two operations. I can ask the chat GPT something from service no site we can actually talk to chat GPT and ask it certain questions. So let's ask talk 
10 views in the world. So ServiceNow is actually communicating with ChatGPT right now. And ChatGPT is going to give us a response. These are, this information is not coming from ServiceNow. It's an integration in place and ChatGPT is giving all this data to us. So how are we going to replicate this? So in this scenario, we will be using some uh, flow designer actions. We'd be using some REST API calls. We will be using some uh, business rules and scripting rules. So this is where you understand all the scripts and we'll be able to uh, you know, get this end solution once we configure everything. So the expectation is this, we can go ahead and create something that will help us to see how uh, we are able to give this as an end solution. So let's go ahead and say goodbye to our chat GPT and get started with our integration. Okay, looking into this, the first thing we need to do is create some account in the open AI systems. So all those needs to happen because uh, we need certain keys. Uh, without that key, it would be difficult for us to go ahead and uh, create all these activities. So first you need to have a key. This key is going to, uh, you know, you need to create this from your uh, platform.openai API keys. So I'm going to quickly pass my window while I log in. Yeah, now I have this. So you need to navigate to this platform openai.org and uh, create your own key. So I need this key first because this is how I authenticate from service now to the platform AI to allow me all these things to get it working. So as in when I have this, I can navigate back to service now and create a REST message. So understand that REST is a protocol. Uh, you can call this as a protocol using which uh, you know, different systems interact with each other. So REST APIs, APIs are application packaging interface. So if you want to talk to a different application, uh, the interface should be available. And that's how you interface, talk between two different machines. So once you have this, uh, you know, understanding about how REST APIs work, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, create a REST message. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and create new. This example is mostly going to be open AI. And the endpoint, I already have this. So the endpoint is mostly going to be constant in most of the scenarios. So it be HTTPS API dot open AI dot com slash v1 slash completions so i can find all these ai related information in the references api references and documentations here so i can play around that give the endpoint which is api open ai dot com v1 completions the next thing that uh, we need to do is go ahead and uh, make some changes on the uh, HTTP request for this method, but uh, let's not do this. We have uh, methods wherein we need to go ahead and configure them. So the method by default, it creates a default get. So we can directly go ahead, click on new and create a, create a post method. Because post method is where it actually goes and post whatever we are uh, giving the information during our chat. Let's say ask open AI something and the endpoint is going to be the same. You can actually copy it from the previous ones. HTTP API dot open AI dot com slash one slash shuns. So we have this next thing is the HTTP request. 
we need to add the headers in our example here. So the first one is authorization. So this is where we'd be giving our key. So the key, whichever that got created in our OpenAI systems, you can go ahead and give that here. So we'll see bearer. Let me go ahead and create a new key. Test key, create this, copy this, and I'm done. So I'm going to set this to this, that is bearer, Let's paste this, and save it. This is very sensitive, so I'm going to delete it as soon as you know the session is done. So let's go ahead and go for the content type. In this case, this is going to be application JSON. So the next thing that we need to add is the content. So for content, we are going to follow the JSON format again. So we need to define what model of chat GPT we are going to communicate with. So we need to add all those parameters. So the first one is model. In the same format, we need to add four more parameters that the open AI system that is you know, requesting for. So the next one is prompt. So prompt is the one where we are going to give our data. Any inputs is going to go in the prompt. Next one is temperature. So temperature is the one that talks about how intelligent this particular chat GPT system is. And then finally, we have max tokens. Paste this. Then we have our max tokens here. So temperature and model are fine. We don't need to give them in quotes. Can remove this. So temperature and max tokens. So I go ahead and define tokens. So all these are given now. We have the basic set of information. Let us go ahead and save this. So here the prompt, everything available. We have an option to auto-generate variables. So click on this to generate your variables. And as and when the variable is available, we can actually go ahead and test them. So let's give the test value as 1024 for tokens. And uh, the model is text da win c. Zero, zero, 003. This is the model that we are going to talk with. And question, let's talk. Let's what can we ask now? So um, pop news in India. Yeah. Temperature, let's keep the intelligence between anywhere between zero to one. So we have the test value. So if I click on test. Here on my method, this will initiate the integration of service now to chat GPT and right now we are testing out. So I can see the status is 200, which means this worked fine without any issues. And it talks about the yes, top three news. So the first one we are seeing here, Corona in India and India launches contact tracing app. And then the final one is India right now. Some information, but yeah, we'll keep all these just for testing purpose. So we are able to test. Everything is working fine. Uh, integration is okay. The BR tokens and authorization tokens, whatever we have given, is completely fine, and it's able to ask the OpenAI system 
anything based on whatever method that we have defined. So go ahead and uh, preview the script usage, copy the snippet once the script comes up. So we need this again, copy this. We are going to create a server side script right now. So let us go ahead and create a business tool or yeah, let's do the script includes. So navigate to system definitions, script includes, and let's create one. You can say open AI utils. So the API name comes up and we have this here. All we need to do is now go ahead and define a function here. So we need our code to be available inside a function. So how do we define that? Right, ask open AI function. And this opens up a function for us here. Uh, yeah, we are missing a colon. And we have already copied a code. We can paste all of them right here. Let's format this, select all, format code. And if needed, we can actually do a try catch, but let's keep the code simple. We'll only do the try part of this. So now that we have, uh, there is no need for all these comments we Can remove them. We have a basic code that we can actually trigger or use this. Let us go ahead and define some variables. We need variable model. We need variable empty, sure. So find it empty. We need variable for max tokens. And set all these values here. So the prompt again, we need prompt also. So how do we get that prompt? So I can add that as a parameter here. Prompt message. So I'm gonna take the model value from here instead of hard coding it. So then you know, as and when there's a need to change, I can change it over here. And I'll change this to model. Temperature goes the same. So I'll change this to 0 0.5. Copy this value from here and paste it over here. So this is a number value, numeric value. Does it need to be a string? So I change this and I keep the temperature here. Same goes for tokens. So it's a numeric one. You can say it like this and get this value. Okay, and now the prompt is going to be a function parameter that we are passing here. So this is pretty much sufficient for us. So the next thing that we need to do is right now, we need to process the response that the OpenAI system is going to give us. So in our example, we saw how we can process using our uh, you know, op, uh, test systems that is provided as part of the REST message. So as this quick example, we need to get the response and process them now. So how do we get that? The response is already available for us in the response variable. So we are going to uh, create an object for a response. So I can say response object and then call a JSON script and then put a response body into this. So as we do this now response object has a JSON object notation for all this and I can say one more variable that is open AI answers. So all the answers that are provided by OpenAI can actually be 
put into this now you can do response object dot choices instead of the zero one and then the text in it, inside it so everything gets stored right now on open ai answers the next thing i need to do is return them and what am i going to return all the open ai answers so script include is a reusable server side code and using the server side code i'm following the rest message that we created there and whenever any user or any application that is trying to call this particular script include they'll be returned with this answers that is coming in the response object so i can go ahead and save this we have our script include ready now now the next thing that we are going to do is go ahead and create an action how are we going to do that so go for flow designers we're going to play around with our flow designers and create a simple action so this is the action that is going to be called whenever uh, the virtual agent comes into picture and using this action we'll be creating uh, we'll be making a call to our scripting tool so you can go ahead create an action from the flow designer and say that open ai integrations submit this now you know, we need an input the input is going to be the prompt message that we need to give so give a prompt keep this mandatory now we have this uh, input available next thing is we need to create a action here and this is going to be script so we have a custom script action using which we can actually call some scripts and here it's going to be again okay, prompt the value for prompt is going to be the one that we just created earlier so click on this we have a data picker we have our inputs inside inputs we have created prompt and this is a place where we would be calling our script include now so it is pretty simple to call uh, all we need is to store our outputs we have inputs and outputs already defined so go for outputs dot answer we are going to create a function call to our open ai utils so you need the name of the uh, script include so copy the name go back to the flow designer give it the name give the function call the next thing is i need to call the function so inside the script include we have this function which we need to call and we are going to pass the inputs into this input start prompt because this is the one that we are taking as an input and we are passing this as a parameter which it will take inside this function so the function will have the prompt message with whatever inputs that have been given to this particular function call and then this goes to the outputs dot answer and we need to define an answer variable in outputs here so we call this answer this is going to be mandatory again so we have defined our script actions all that's left is to go ahead and create an output so create an output variable uh, this is again going to be answer and okay, this answer the same we need this to be mandatory so we need one more uh, we have answer now outputs given and this answer 
let us go ahead and edit this. We should have action status available. Let us see. Status. This needs to be type object. So I can save this. Yeah, actually, this gets created automatically, so we can remove this. We have our inputs ready. We have our script calls made. And then we have our output available for us here. So the answer here, uh, this needs to be the answer. So I can directly get it. So from the script step, we can give this answer back to this. So I don't have to give uh, anything dedicatedly here. But it asks for some value. So we can go ahead and check out all the other ones. So edit outputs. We have this here. We can move back. So all that's needed for us is to go ahead and test this. We can ideally remove all the values, check how things are there. And let's say if I go for this and save this. This is saved. We can actually test this. The first thing that we need to do is publish this and go ahead and publish this particular record. Yeah, I forgot to give this particular one. Let us publish this. Okay, now this is fine. We have published this. All that's left is to go ahead and create a virtual agent topic now. How do we do that? Back to virtual designer. Virtual agent designer. In this virtual agent designer, we are going to create a new topic that is going to talk with our open AI systems. Open AI. Then give everything as default and just click on new. So by default, it will get us start and end. And now we need to take user inputs. So we are going to use Text. I'm gonna give the node name as user inputs. And this is going to have the script that is available for me. So, what I need to do is probably uh, we need to have a prompt. This prompt, I'm gonna write some script to it. So, I'll come back to this and save this to default. We already have one created. So I'll show you how this. So we have this. We are going to take this script and I'm going to use this in our input here. So this, this is 
Now, once we have this data, it's all the user input that uh, we are taking. Now we need to have a decision made because this is where we decide if the input is valid or not. So we can take the decision tree and paste it here. We can always add, and then say invalid input, or we can say our uh, end conversation. The condition you can add some conditions. This is going to have conditions that are nothing but user input contains by. Let us simply save this and can add condition. This is a valid question. When can it be valid? Probably when the user input does not contain by. So if I'm saying by, which means I'm going to close this. Now I need this to perform some action. You can keep this action here. Let me first uh, close this. I need to put this back to, if it's a valid question, this needs to again ask me the next question. Do this and click, drag, drop it back to user inputs. So when it is a valid question, I can ask back the questions back to it again. Make sure that you're putting it after user input. And now I need to ask open AI something. I need to select a spoke. So theory collect, uh, this is the one that we just created. So we are going to ask from a global scope. And then the action is open AI integrations. And this needs input because prompt we have marked that as mandatory. I can use a data pill, select input variables, and this is going to be user, uh, user inputs. We can leave the rest of these to default. This is all set. We can save this. Hopefully there's no error and we can try testing it. So the testing actually uh, initiates a virtual agent topic, whatever that we have created. And this will ask, let us give the input as what is service now? And this is the testing integrations. So preview only options will come and something is happening in the back end. We got the response and things are working fine. I got some response, you can go ahead and click on buy. So, which means we can see some dotted line has come up and this has closed our integration. So I'm gonna save this again. Let's go ahead and publish this. So once published, this should be available for us in our portal to communicate. We'll go to our portal and we'll check our virtual agent for a new topic. We'll ask it to show everything and we have OpenAI integration available. And this is saying this is opening a talking and how can I help you? Let's say who's going to win today's field match. So it gives us a uh, information again, everything is happening in the back end. Make sure that you know it says it is impossible to predict, but uh, all this is happening in the back end. It talks to the OpenAI system and gets all this data. You can ask uh, 
this that hey, here match to it. Uh, you know, the limitations are very less because this is a, a trial account and you have a limit to how much API calls you can make. Once that is exhausted, you may no longer need. So quick wrap up, what all we did, we created a business rule, uh, sorry, we created a server side code, which is our script includes, and uh, we can do the same with the help of a business rule also. Uh, we can create, uh, we created a flow designer action. So we can create a action to call any script includes. And then we created a virtual agent topic using the topic we call the action. The action in turn calls the script include, the script include in turn calls a REST messages. So uh, this is done and it's still loading, but I'm hoping I'm exhausted my limit. So I'm just gonna cancel this and then we can produce a conversation. It keeps on loading, but that happens sometimes. We can choose this. So this is around using the virtual agent API integrations and all those. So you can write some business rules you can write some client scripts. All this will uh, help us in creating this integration, but ideally it is based on use cases. Case by case, as per the request, you can go ahead and play around with them. This leaves us with our final topic that is on service portal and scoped applications. So uh, in our earlier uh, discussions, we've touched space about scope so scope ideally just keeps the application within the boundary of whatever we define. So let's say I am creating a service provisioning request as an application. So a different application that is having a different scope will not be able to, you know, on a out of the box configuration, be able to, you know, make any changes or configure the application that is residing in a different scope. So you can say that uh, creating a scoped application ideally means you're creating a secure application that is not impacting the instance. So what happens is when you make any changes in the global applications that is already available, let's say an existing business rule or scripting rule or any properties, if you go out and make a change, ServiceNow will understand that it is a customer configuration and do not make any changes to it by default. So what happens during an upgrade or a pass release with ServiceNow is Introducing new lines of code to the script, that code will not get added because the particular file is edited by customer. If I write my code on top of it, it may overwrite the customer's configuration. So in those cases, those files will be skipped and uh, you know there will be impact during upgrades. This impact again needs to be evaluated and manual activity, manual intervention is required. So to avoid this is where you need to always use you know scoped applications or go with your own uh, you know customization instead of touching out of the box codes and portal pages widgets are the one that uh, we would be using when it comes to you know creating our own portal so uh, this is where uh, you know we give a, a nice user interface to our end users and uh, we can use this interface to I'll go ahead and uh, say that, okay, I'm uh, publishing this and uh, use this for uh, the consumption. So end users need a portal, they need a, a good look and feel so that they can go ahead and configure all these, uh, you know, creating tickets or creating record producers, all those can be placed there uh, as a request and we can create this. Portal goes by three ways, uh, portal, pages, and widgets. All these three are needed. So for example, if we look into our portal configurations, by default, there is a portal defined for us. That is our service portal. And this is how it looks like. Every portal will have its own page. So if we go ahead and look uh, the designer, we'll get an idea about how our existing service portal is looking like. So it will have a page and inside the page, it will have a lot of widgets. And that widgets are the one that is responsible for the look and feel of it. So I can do a control click on anything, or a control right click. 
it will say page and designer or widget and designer. So we can open the page. You can see how the page looks like. It has all the container information, widget information. I can just drag and drop here. And similarly, if I want to edit the widget, you can always control right click and do a widget and editor. So the widget will have all the code that is you know, uh, responsible for populating all this information in the portal side. So it will always have a HTML template, some client side script, some server side script to process whatever that we are doing right now on the home page. So portal, as we said, uh, page designer comes up here, but ideally service portal will have home pages. It can have multiple pages. So you can go into service portal. And the one that we are doing is this one. It has the home page, but it has a lot of other pages also like this. So we can define you know, any page is a catalog home page. This is how it looks like. This is our catalog home page. So I can have multiple pages created. Every page should have its own widgets and every widget will have quotes that are defined in this way. So this wraps up our session here. So on a high level, we've discussed about all this concept on what is a platform, how the platform works, list view, form view, how we can create a user table, how ACLs are working, how we can load data into the system, how notifications are working, and getting started with you know, service catalog. And some scripts, we wrote some uh, business, uh, sorry, we wrote some scripting clues, we played around with some pro designer actions, we created some virtual agent topics, and these are how that works. And on a high level, we got an understanding about service portal. So to know more, uh, feel free to reach out to us and uh, uh, we can help you assist in you know, getting all these clarified on a you know, time deep basis. That's pretty much it. This wraps up our session. So thank you so much for joining and uh, that's all from us.